This is ReTV Documentary. The expression crocodile tears means to display insincere expressions of sorrow or tears. It comes from an old myth that crocodiles cry while eating, which actually now researchers at the University of Florida have concluded that crocodiles really do cry while eating. Murderers are generally narcissistic by nature and often insert themselves into the investigation and as a result, we have loads of examples of murderers crying crocodile tears in TV interviews and press conferences. Each case in this series will be covered individually and in more detail, so make sure you subscribe if you want to be notified when they are uploaded. Here are the first five of the series. Mick and Mairead Philpot. I can't even stand to say his name. He disgusts me on every level. This piece of filth was found guilty of causing the deaths of five of his 17 children and one of their half-brothers by burning the family home down in an attempt to play the hero. He has been described as clinically a psychopath, an exhibitionist with antisocial personality disorder. Britain first became aware of this absolute scum through the media as a result of his large family and his reliance on state benefits when Mick complained his house was not big enough for him, his two football teams worth of kids, his wife and his girlfriend. Philpott's attitude towards women has been described as controlling, domineering, violent and manipulative. In 1978, aged 21, Philpott attempted to murder his girlfriend, who was just 15 when they began dating. He stabbed her over a dozen times as she was lying in bed because she wrote him a letter telling him she was leaving. He also stabbed her mother when she came to her aid. He had previously shot her in the groin with a crossbow because he thought her skirt was too short and cracked her kneecap with a hammer when she paid too much attention to a baby she was watching. He was sentenced to seven years for the attempted murder and was released after three. That's the British justice system for you. Attempt to murder an innocent girl and get no time at all. Steal from a banker, however, and you rot in jail. Before murdering his children, Philpot had appeared on multiple TV shows, earning himself the nickname Shameless Mick, including The Joke of British TV, The Jeremy Kyle Show, and a show with Anne Widdicombe, which was basically about him showing the world what a lazy, disgusting, abusive excuse for a man that he is. Although this man disgusts me in every way possible, I can't, however, ignore the fact that monsters are not born. They are made. I just keep wondering what happened to this man in his childhood to make him this way. It was likely a horrific childhood and I just picture a little boy who was never rescued. These monsters, more often than not, were once the victim. And who was there to protect them when it was them being abused or beaten as a child? Where was that little boy's justice? If we want to protect ourselves and our children against these monsters, we have to understand them and not just ignore the root cause of what we perceive as pure evil. Make sure you subscribe if you want to be notified of when the full episode on Mick Philpot is uploaded including some statement and body language analysis of a child killing psychopath. First of all, I want to thank my three oldest children because they helped us to cope with what's going off. And then there's a young lad called Daniel Stevenson who tried to get in the house the same as myself, um, Joe across the road, and the Butler brothers. And of course there's the poor firemen, the police, the ambulances, the doctors, the nurses, Literally everybody who's, who tried to, try to help save our children, they couldn't. <laughs> Let's excuse me a minute. <laughs> We've decided that through our son, Dwayne, Unfortunately, the last one's passed away. That we're going to donate his his organs to save another child, which is what we want. Because if you can save another child, that that makes us happy. It takes a bit of the pain away, and we can't express our gratitude to everybody that's been concerned with the case, with what's been going on. Um. I've actually been down to my our our home, and what we saw, we just we just cannot believe it. <laughs> we grew up in a community that's been had a lot of problems with violence and, and God knows what else. And to see this community to, to come together like the abyss just 
it's just too overwhelming. We've had people from America, France, even the travelling, I mean the travelling community, it's just, we've been to see them, it's just overwhelming, isn't it? But I say I can't express enough the, 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 the police, the fire brigade, the ambulance services, because what we feel, them poor gentlemen from the fire brigade who saw what, what we've seen, you know, my heart goes out to them, because it's not just us, it's suffering, it's them as well, it's everybody. It's... But there's one thing I would request is please, please leave my family alone. If you've got any questions or anything at all, please don't come through me or my family. Please go to the police because what's happening at the moment, you are disrupting what these officers are trying to do. So please, I beg you, leave us alone and let us try and grieve in peace and quiet. That's all I ask. Thank you. Stephen McDaniel. In June 2011, Stephen McDaniel murdered and dismembered fellow law student Lauren Giddings. Like many other murderers, McDaniel cried on a TV interview, quickly gathering the attention of police. Lauren and McDaniel had been neighbours for a few years and he had shown unwanted attention towards Lauren, even asking her out a few times and eventually began to stalk her, going so far as to film her in her own home without her knowledge. The footage on screen now is the actual footage taken by McDaniel of Lauren's apartment. On the 26th of June 2011, McDaniel, wearing a mask, entered Lauren Giddings' apartment unauthorised using a master key while she was asleep in her room. She awoke to find McDaniel standing over her. She shouted at him to get out when he began to attack her. They wrestled to the ground, at which point Lauren pulled off his mask and McDaniel strangled her to death and dismembered her body in the bath with a hacksaw. Shortly after Lauren Giddings' body was discovered, McDaniel was interviewed by a news station, but as McDaniel had been at the police station for most of the day, he was unaware that they had found Lauren's body. Following are clips of three news interviews that McDaniel gave that day. Yeah, Lauren was my neighbour. The first of many red flags in this interview comes within the first five words. More specifically, the third word, was. Yeah, Lauren was my neighbour. At this point in the interview, McDaniel was supposed to be unaware of what had happened to Lauren, and as far as he was concerned, she was still just missing at this point. His use of the word was could in fact be because Lauren was supposed to have been moving on the day that that interview was recorded, and would no longer have been his neighbour the day after. But she hadn't moved yet. As far as he was concerned, at that point, she was still his neighbour. Be sure to subscribe if you want to be notified of when the full body language and statement analysis video on this case is uploaded. Yeah, Lauren was my neighbour. Um, we're just trying to find out where she is at this point. I mean, no one has seen her since Saturday. I mean, the last time anyone heard from her was an email that she sent out and I mean, no one's heard from her since. Did you see her hang out with anyone at the time, anything like that? I mean, no, no, no one has seen her since Saturday. I haven't seen anything. I mean, you always hear noise outside, but it's just people walking by pretty much. And you, uh, she just recently graduated from Mercer. Yeah, she and I were we were both JD students. Um, we graduated back in May. What kind of person was she? I mean, how did you, what did you see? Her? I mean, she's as nice as can be. I mean, very personable, very much a people person. Do you know anybody that, any enemies she might have had, somebody that might want to hurt her? No, I mean, we're, we don't know where she is. I mean, the only thing we can think is that maybe she went out running and someone snatched her. Because, I mean, we went, at, we went over, one of her friends had a key, we went inside and tried to see if there was anything a miss, but I mean, she had a door jam that was sitting right by it, so there was no sign that anyone broke in. I mean, the door was locked when everyone got here. I mean, we, we just don't know where she is. What about um, in the like the parking lot area? I know they've been doing a lot of, I think that's where they have recovered the body or whatever they recovered from there. Um, body? Had you heard, had you seen anything there? Had you seen anything there? I I mean, we don't know if this is the same person. You know what I mean? Like, they took out a body there earlier. We don't know if it's the same person or not. So that's how we're trying to ask people if they know who lived there. Are you okay, sir? I think I need to sit down. Okay. Okay.
Okay, that's the uh, first clip of uh, video Michelle Casada did with Stephen McDaniel last Thursday, mm -hmm. uh, a, a week ago. Uh, it, to you, did he seem genuinely upset with the fact that the body had been discovered? Yeah, definitely. I mean, his expression, as you see in the beginning of the interview, he's very forthcoming with information. You know, he's calm. At this point, he only thinks that she's missing. So I guess he's, you know, just offering information, anything that he can do to help. And then as soon as I mentioned the body, which I assumed that he already knew since everyone had been out there since 10 a.m. Mm. and had been all over the news, all over the web. And I guess he had been pulled in for questioning and police, I, I don't know what police have told him, police mm -hmm. had told him at that time. So I guess no one had informed him that a body was recovered. All right, the second uh, video, what will we see? Okay, so the second video is um, he actually gets pulled into the AT&T building next door. One of the employees brought him in, I guess, to just relax for a couple minutes after mm -hmm. he found out about the news. And um, then he comes back out maybe 20 minutes later, and I asked him if he was okay, and he came up to me and began talking again. Okay. So at this point, our camera started rolling again, and he seemed receptive to it. He was not, you know, he was not upset, saying that he didn't want to talk, so he just mm -hmm. started talking again. All right, uh, clip two with uh, Stephen McGee. Daniel Michelle Casada from last Thursday. Guys? You've been studying for the bar? Uh, I no one had seen her since Saturday because I we all just there's not a whole lot of interaction unless we're doing classes. Right. And she was doing the uh, online version of it. You all so studied together though? I uh, we were in this there's two different people that there's two companies that provide it. Captain provides it and Barbie provides it. I signed up with Barbary and I've been doing the lectures that they have in the mornings. She was doing the Kaplan online, so I hardly ever saw her. I, mean, I would see her like, go out running, but I mean, What time would she go out running? I, mean, I don't even know when. Was it I mean, at night or morning? I, I saw her like midday a, a couple weeks ago. I mean, that was the last time I saw her was coming back from the bar prep on the main campus because we got moved over there for a week or two. But she normally would run. That was yeah, I mean, that she, she, she ran all the time. I mean, she, she had a group that she would go running with. I mean, I, I, I don't know anyone that would want to hurt her. She was as nice a person as there is. Was she moving soon? Did you know anything about her? Yeah, yeah. She she was going to be moving out uh, today. She was supposed to move out today because someone else was going to be moving into her apartment in New Boston. Do you know if she was like, where is she from? Is she uh, from Maryland? Maryland yeah, she's from up in Maryland. Let's put this on you so we can hear you. Is that all right? Okay. I'm so sorry. Yeah, and you can just hold on. Thank you. Yeah, she's from Maryland. Yeah, I mean, she she was from up in Maryland. I mean, all her family was there, as far as I know. I mean, she. What's going on in your mind right now? Like, what are you thinking? Why would anyone do this? She didn't hear anything. No. She didn't see anybody. I. <laughs> yeah, I just heard something. Maybe I could have helped. <laughs> it's okay, don't worry. Do you want to sit down for a second? You got something to drink? Do you know if a bunch of her friends are getting together or anything? I mean, that's how I found out that she was missing. We, a bunch of her friends came over yesterday night around midnight and they they couldn't they hadn't seen her since Saturday so they were trying to find out where she was. So they were knocking on neighbors' doors and stuff. I no they they went in they had a key to her apartment and they checked around didn't see anything out of place I mean it was locked when everyone got there. That was midnight. Yeah, around midnight and then we went we went over to law school to see if maybe she was over in the, the library studying or something. And we, we looked up in the study rooms on the third floor, and there was, there was no one there. And we came back, we looked around, and just tried to find any anything to figure out where she was. She doesn't have any family in Georgia? I don't, I don't know. I mean, as far as I know, every all of her family is up from in Maryland. Have you met her family before? I, I, there, there was one time that I met them. They came down first year. She she had a little dog, a little brown dog, 
that she would uh, exercise out in front of the law school and it got hit as she was coming across the road. I, I heard the car hit it and ran out and she was there crying and we thankfully there was someone who came along who knew a vet or something and they helped that and the her family came down uh, I think a, a couple weeks after that or something and I met them just briefly right. but uh, is there a boyfriend or anything? I we we've been trying to figure out she has a boyfriend up in Atlanta but I mean, someone called her called him and he hadn't heard from her and just no no one could figure out where she was so with the last question they with you said that somebody seen her on Saturday yeah she went over to a couple friends house the Garen Mueller and Joe Karens they live over on Walnut and I mean, they they said that she was over there in the morning and then that was the last time that anyone we've been able to find out from had seen her. She hadn't mentioned what she was going to do that day or anything? Uh, we, uh, Joe, he got onto her computer last night to see if she had said anything. She'd sent an email out to some people that afternoon talking about like going out to eat or something. And the last thing that anyone, there was an email that she sent out after 10 that night where she she sent to, I think it was someone in Atlanta, a friend of hers in Atlanta, and he, she said that she she was afraid in her apartment that she thought that someone had tried to break in on Thursday night, and she she was afraid to stay in there. But where did you hear? Where did you hear that from? From Joe? No, uh, he he pulled it up and we we read it off the screen. And she had said that to a friend in Atlanta. Yeah. I, I can't remember his name, but... And you hadn't heard anything on Thursday night? No. Weekend? She no. never came to you to tell you anything? No, I... I if she had, I, I could have done something. I I could have lent her a handgun. I've, I've got a little handgun that I have for defense. And she could have slept over or something? Yeah, I mean, something. I mean, if she was afraid in her apartment, then, I mean, get her out of there. Is that her right then? That, that's what she said in the email. She thought that someone had tried to break into her apartment. She said, like, Macon Hoodlums tried to break into my apartment on Thursday night. Is that her car parked there? The Chevy? No. The car? No. Um, the, I think that that's the detective's car, Detective well, her Patterson. Car's not even there? No, it, it was here earlier and they, they towed it. I mean, it had been there for days and then they towed it to, I guess, look through, see if there was. Yeah. How did you find out that something yeah, was wrong with the police here? Was it like when you walked up a little while ago? Or? No, I mean, we, the police were called last night and they came and they looked around and they didn't see anything. I mean, they went in, we looked around the place, uh, no sign of a struggle, no sign that anyone had broken in, just nothing. Just she was gone. I mean, all of her stuff was there, her ID was there, her wallet was there. But We've got a third piece of video mm -hmm. here. Let's do that, and uh, after that, we'll take the break, and we'll come back, and we want to talk to you about some of this, and you can fill in some of the gaps now. Okay. All right, so guys, part three of the interview Michelle did with uh, Stephen McDaniel from a week ago. Where's the audio? We can't hear it. And then this morning they knocked on my door. They were looking around trying to find anything. And a few, a few of the other friends, uh, Burpee, uh, Burpee and Garen and Ashley, they were here. They were here last night and they'd come back this morning. And I just went out and talked with them and they... And then they moved us all over to the side and they bust us all down to the department and kept us there until I got back just a little while ago. And they asked questions. Mm. Yeah, they, they took statements trying to find out if anyone had seen anything, if anyone had heard anything when the last time anyone saw it or was. Now, they haven't confirmed, at least not with us, that it, it was um, or that they found 
Are you holding out any hope right now? I mean, I, I hope, but um, if, if they found it on on the property somewhere. Heard anything about a body until you were talking to us? Or? No. No. As far as any of us knew, they, they were still trying to just find her. I mean, we got an email this morning from some people that live on the other side of Kroger, on the other side of the river, that they had seen her in the past running in that area. We thought maybe someone had snatched her over there, or maybe she got hurt or something. Stuart Hazel. 12-year-old Tia Sharp was reported missing from her grandmother's home in New Addington, London, in August of 2012. Seven days later, her body was found in the loft of that house, and her grandmother was arrested along with her partner, Stuart Hazel, and her neighbour, Paul Meehan, on suspicion of murder. From what I gather... Hazel was also the former boyfriend of Tia's mother. The charges against Tia's grandmother were dropped, but can you imagine being so desperate for a man that you end up with your daughter's ex, a waste of space only looking for a roof over his head, which became evident a week after they got together by him moving in? What a disgrace this woman is. I genuinely would not be surprised if Christine Bicknell, Tia's grandmother, was in fact involved in the death of her granddaughter. There's so many women so desperate not to be alone. Unfortunately, some of them allow their children and grandchildren to be abused through fear of losing that person. There are, unfortunately, many examples of this. I guess one that springs to mind is the mother of a one-year-old baby who conspired with Ian Watkins, the lead singer of the Welsh band Lost Prophets, along with another woman, to abuse her baby. During the investigation, Hazel made multiple TV appearances and pointed out, in fact, wanted to make very clear that all he knows is Tia left left that house that day. He wants you to take note of this, but as we all now know, Tia never left that house and he knew full well as he had sexually assaulted, murdered and hid her body wrapped in a bedsheet in the loft. Hazel maintained his innocence until day five of the trial when he changed his plea to guilty. She came downstairs, she sat down, um, just sat down here, what the chair where Dave, where you are now Dave? Uh, Sitting there watching telly, she picked up her uh, mum's DS up, played the DS for a little while. I said, Well, we're going to have some breakfast. So she, I made her some toast, and she had toast, and then she wanted a sausage roll because she's always eating sausage rolls. Uh, uh, basically, and then she was sitting there, she doesn't take her washing up out, so I took her washing up out. Um, just started doing a little bit of washing up in the kitchen. She was in there, she was telling me what she was doing, but I weren't really logging it into my head. I, didn't, do you know what I mean? You know, like the kids, they talk to you, it goes in one ear, stays there for a second, it goes out, you know what I mean? Then I was washing up, mopping the sides down. Um, I missed that, the, and the, the hoovering, I was doing hoovering there, but I, what it was, I started off sweeping up in there, but we, where we have a rug, I can't sweep the rug, so I had to hoover the rug because it's got, it's like really fluffy. So I've hoovered the rug off. I've hoovered all the way out to the front door, literally the kitchen, the hallway. I've got out there, uh, I've come back with another cigarette. Uh, this time, too, I've gone upstairs, I've got the washing, sorry, after I've done the whole way there, I've gone upstairs, done the washing, make sure there's no washing upstairs, made the bed, opened the curtains, uh, come back downstairs. Uh, by then, Tia's going upstairs to get changed. Uh, she was still mumbling away. Uh, I can't remember what she was bloody on about, to be honest with her, excuse my language. Um, uh, well, basically, uh, I was in the kitchen, then just finished off all that, then I come back in here, finished off my hoovering in the front room in the hallway, got to there, when I got the dog's bed, I emptied the dog's beds out. Um, as I was hoovering, then she walked out, the, she walked past me from the front room to go out, and she walked out the front door, that is all I know. And she left her bloody phone on charge, because I told her to sit there and leave her phone on charge. I didn't mean leave it on charge, because what's Tia doing, she plays on the on the the BB thing, but then she uses it as it's charging. So there's no charge going through to it. So when I said to her, leave, le just leave your phone on charge. It means leave her phone on charge, not use it, let it charge up a bit. Then you can actually take it with you or, mm. or whatever. Because she's been responsible to go to Croydon before. She was responsible to go on trains and buses and trams and everything before on her own. Mm. Not so much trains, but tra uh, trams and buses. She's done it all on her own and. It was just an everyday thing.
you know, it's just that one time you want to bloody listen to her and you just don't. Uh, she said, uh, oh, goodbye. Well, I said, well, make sure you're back at six. She went, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was it. And then the door closed and she walks out. And what about keys, things like that? Does she have a front door key? No, I would, would have been, I would have been home. Right. I would have been home. But does she have a front door key? No, she doesn't have a front door key. Right. Because someone's always here. If no one's here, then she goes to one of her friends on the estate or literally her neighbours or someone like that. Right. And I know exactly what she was wearing. She was wearing exactly what she had when she came up here because I washed her clothes that night. Right. Tell me what that was. It was a yellow... I thought it was a, t a tight tube thing, but it was, all I know is it was yellow, right? And she had this grey, sort of like, really... It looked like jeans, but they weren't jeans. She, I'm sure she said they were jeggings or think or something like Chinos. that. Chinos or something like that. I don't know. I'm not up on women's clothes, what they call them. They've got a different name, but it was basically the yellow top. She had her trainers on because her rug boots were up there, <coughs> and she only had them, and she wouldn't wear that when she was going out because she was only going out to buy the flip flop. That was it. She was adamant to go and buy flip flops. Right. And what, what else did she do? Was she carrying a bag? Did she have she anything else? She didn't have nothing, no, she didn't have nothing on her at all. Yeah. Nothing at all. She didn't have an Oyster car because she lost that months ago. So, so, so how was she going to buy the, the flip-flops? Well, I gave her a tenner because she's, well, what, the agreement is that she, on, when, she, when, we was here, when she was here for the weekend, she helps me do things around the house, like do the back garden, do the front garden, which still ain't done. Um, so I give her a tenner. She helped me do the washing up like the night before, just a little bit of dusting and stuff like that. Do you know what I mean? But uh, yeah, I'll just give her that because then it earns her responsibility and how to do things. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Not so much to do things for money, but just to do things. And plus, it was a bit of pocket money for her anyway. And tell me a little bit about Tia's life. I mean, is she a happy girl? Is she jolly? Has she got any problems? No, she's got no problems at all. She's she's a happy go lucky golden. Angel, you know what I mean? She's, she's, she's perfect. She's, there's no arguments, no nothing, no nothing we can think of, absolutely nothing. And tell me about the Thursday night, because obviously there was just the two of you. Did you have a meal? Did you talk? Did you, uh, was there any uh, particular conversation? Was a meal? Yeah, we, oh, we had a meal that night, because when we went to co-op, we bought these things, I bought them for Chris, but then Tia ate three of these lollies, knobbly bobblies, and she was going to eat the last one. I said, no, I'll leave that for your name, because... You know, <laughs> I wish he'd come back with an empty box in the bin and then he go mad. But no, we had munchies, we had like pizza, uh, uh, pizza chips, which I've made her another one, but she's still on the oven now. I mean, so I, I, I mean, the chips. I was getting a bit concerned. Well, Tia was meant to be home at six. Uh, we was getting a bit concerned about seven, do you know what I mean? Uh, I was looking out the door, I thought she might have been playing at the front. Um, things about quarter past seven half seven or something like that where uh, I've mentioned to Chris earlier on the day because Chris come home at half past two. Um, uh, just about the fair, so what we done, we got in the, in the car and went down to the fun fair where to, I thought she might have like snuck out or something, snuck off to the fun fair saying she's going wherever, whatever. Uh, we went down to the fun fair. Um, was it Alpington, wasn't it? Uh, no, it's... Was it, um, um, Ashburton. Ashburton, Ashburton Park. Ashburton Park. Yeah. Uh, went down there, uh, I, walked, I walked the perimeter of the fun fair on the outside of the fence to see if I could see her. Me and Chris uh, couldn't see her, so I went up to the security guard uh, by the main gates. He, we explained what happened, uh, but my granddaughter might have snuck off in there. So uh, we went. he let us in there, go and have a look around, was in there for a good hour. Look, walked all the way around. Chris went one way, I went the other, looked on every single ride, all the arcades, uh, stood by the the ghost train things, ghost tunnels. We looked everywhere basically. Um, and we come out and then we went to Natalie's, literally. We went to Natalie's and then after that, we didn't know what to do. I didn't know we were a reporter missing. We, we've, we'd been back and forth. We went from the fun fair, no, we went from the fun fair, we come back home and then we went to Natalie's straight from there because we thought she might have like come back. But I was way back from the fun fair. I noticed, and Chris noticed, that there was a 130 bus. No, two and two together in my head. I come up 1.30, 1.30 comes down to here. So we basically followed the bus just in case she was on the bus somewhere. Yeah. Um, didn't work out, so we went, to, we went to Natalie's and then we went and reported it straight to the police. Yeah. Oh, it's been horrible, it's been horrible. Do you know what I mean? It, the family's, we're stuck inside here, do you know what I mean? We've got all the papers outside, all putting accusations down and, do you know what I mean? Bad mouthing everyone and, 
it's just what you don't need, you know. I know they're trying to help and that, but they can help in other ways, you know what I mean, by finding her back, get her home, for God's sake. No. Tell what's going on, it's a lovely family, what she's got. Yeah. It just, everyone's it's silly, do you know what I mean? All the hearsay in the papers, they, they've been digging up my previous which has got absolutely nothing to do with it, and they've even got that arse about face. Yeah, everyone's, everyone's, got, everyone's got a silly past. They, they, everyone's got a, like, a shady past, yeah, do you know what I mean? That's 10 years ago, for God's sake. Do you know what I mean? They've gone to my dad, they've seen my dad, he's got everything else back to front, and you know what I mean? It's, and they've just going on what he's saying, and when they say, you say something, they twist your words. Do you know what I mean? I'd love to sit there, and they asked me stupid questions yesterday, like, oh, did you do anything? I said, well, no, I bloody didn't. Excuse my language, but no, I didn't. I'd never think of that. I'd love to, it's a bit, she's like my own daughter, for God's sake. We had that sort of relationship, it was that sort of thing. It was just, do you know, she wanted it, she got it. She's got no, she's got a loving loving home. She's she's never gone without anything. So I can't work it out. What the hell's going on? We're all out there. They want to report the truth. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? They're just just reporting. Just reporting what, to what, home, what nothing, they're talking to people else. around here that don't even know us and getting things off them, but they don't know anything. Do you know what I mean? They're just going on hearsay. Everyone going hearsay. Well, if they believe what they read in the papers, they can do whatever they like. Because I know deep down in my heart that Tia walked out of my house. She walked out of there, and I know damn well because she was seen walking down the pathway. I know she made that track down to that way. What happened after that is I don't know. I just And I wasn't the last person to see her because the last person to see her was the one walking down the pathway. That's, tomorrow's going to be a week that she's been missing. How do you move forward from here? I don't. You just gotta keep hoping that that it doesn't last till tomorrow. We don't want it. We want her now. We want it found now. We don't want it to last till tomorrow. We don't want another week. We don't want no more days. It's, it's not. It's the way it's got to be. She's got to come home now. I feel they're pointing the finger at me because because till the other day it was known that I was the last person to see her, but I wasn't the last person to see her. I mean, they've gone on hearsay, everything like that. But it's not about me. It's about Tia. This is all about Tia, and we've got to get her own, man. We've got to get her own. And just don't know what more to do. Tia, come on, babe. Come on. Come and eat your dinner. I want me £10 back from my garden. Yeah, just we come love on. you, babe. I want come you back, 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 back to normal. There's, Please. There's, there's nothing. It's, it's going to be back to normal. Just, just, just come home and be back in the family. She's part of the family. Come on. Nothing's changed. No one's in trouble. Come on. Um. Ian Huntley In the early evening of August 2002, two ten-year-old girls, Holly Wells and Jessica Chapman, were on their way to buy sweets when they walked past Huntley's rented house near Soham Village College, at which he was a caretaker. Huntley saw them and asked them in, claiming that his girlfriend, the girl's teaching assistant at St Andrew's Primary School in Soham, Cambridgeshire, Maxine Carr, was also at home. However, it's reported that Carr was away visiting relatives at the time, and within a short time of Holly and Jessica having entered the house, Huntley had murdered them both. Huntley used his car to transport their bodies around 20 miles away, where he dumped them in a ditch and set them alight, in a bid to destroy the forensic evidence. Huntley has recently claimed that Carr told him to burn the bodies. Later that evening, Jessica Chapman and Holly Wells were reported missing and a police search began at around midnight. Over the next two weeks, the search escalated to become one of the most widespread and publicised in British history. Several witnesses came forward, including Huntley, who claimed to have seen the girl shortly before they disappeared. His home was searched in order to eliminate him as a suspect. Huntley also granted television interviews to the press, and his unusual interest, together with his emotional involvement, made investigators suspicious, leading to a wider search which revealed the half-burned remains of Holly and Jessica's shirts in a storage building at Soham College where Huntley was employed. Following the find, police arrested Huntley and his girlfriend Carr on suspicion of murder. Later the same day, the 17th of August 2002, 13 days after the girls had disappeared, a game warden discovered the girls' bodies near RAF Lakenheath, an airbase in Suffolk near to Huntley's father's home. Subsequent autopsy reports on the girls listed their probable cause of death as asphyxiation, but their bodies were too badly decomposed to establish whether they had suffered 
suffered any sexual assault. Since Huntley had been accused of rape previously, to me, this was very clearly a sexually motivated crime. The next video I will upload will be some statement and body language analysis of the interviews that Huntley and Carr gave prior to being charged. So again, be sure to subscribe if you want to be notified when this is uploaded. Again, the first red flag in this interview comes within the first few words. How do we know they were here at 6.15? Well, we have an eyewitness. Ian Huntley here is a familiar figure. Evening, Ian. You're the school caretaker. The girls, Jessica and Holly, would know you, and they saw you on the front doorstep. What, what went on? The girl, I don't know the girls. This is called a false start. Huntley realises that he wants to put more distance between himself and the girls and realises that the way he started, the girls, was far too familiar, so straight away corrected himself and wanted you, the viewer, to know that he didn't know the girls. Well, the girl, I don't know the girls. Um, I was still on the front doorstep grooming my dog down. She'd run away and come back a bit of a mess. Um, they just came across and asked how Miss Carr was as she used to teach them at St Andrews. Um, I just said she weren't very good as she hadn't got the job. And they just says, please tell her that we're very sorry. And uh, off the walk in the direction of the, um, the library over there. Which leads us on to Maxine Carr, the girlfriend of Ian Huntley. Although Carr was only sentenced to around three years and served about half of that for preventing the course of justice, there is no doubt in my mind that she is another one of those women so desperate not to lose her man that she will turn a blind eye to the rape and murder of children and is prepared to give a sexual predator a false alibi. Carr was reportedly at her mother's house in Grimsby at the time of the murder. I don't necessarily believe that story and believe that she may even have participated in the crime. If she didn't on that occasion, I do believe she would have in the future. And who knows, since she has anonymity for life, we actually have no idea what she has been up to for the last 15 years. Look at this woman's face. Who does she remind you of? Myra Hinley? Rosemary West? In 2008, Carr was reportedly pregnant, meaning her child would be around the same age as Holly Wells and Jessica Chapman were when her boyfriend raped and murdered them. You've got to question a system that protects paedophiles and murderers and makes criminals out of victims. This is where we set up our main presentation unit. This is where I did a lot of the live programmes that day from the high street, a very noisy little high street here in the heart of Sir. This is where I interviewed Maxine Carr, right here on the pavement on the high street, in what turned out to be a rather revealing interview. Uh, this is something I'll probably keep for the rest of my life, I think. Um, it's what Holly gave me on the last day of term. She was very, very upset because I didn't get my job. And that's the kind of girl she was. She was just lovely. Really lovely. That's really very sweet, isn't it? That's the kind of girl she was. Maxine Carr was talking about the girls in the past tense. At this point, the girls are only missing, which was probably one of the first big red flags of the case. So once again, thanks for watching. If this isn't the first video of mine that you have watched and you are yet to subscribe, what are you waiting for? Smash that subscribe button now. Peace. You've been watching a ReTV documentary.